I'm going to take a slightly different approach from the gentleman who spoke before. Uh, my first and most important request, please stop, stop me at any time and ask a question while I'm still talking. Don't wait until the end. Uh, if you are getting questions, you know at least one or two people are listening to you. If you wait until the end, people may just ask you questions as a courtesy. And uh, I always insist that if you have a question, it's not rude, it's the right thing to do. Just say, what did you mean by that? Or please explain that. And even if in the process I do not go through all that I have prepared here, that's fine. So I want to talk about foreign aid. I'm going to talk about one very famous, famous in Kenya anyway, and spectacular failure. Then I'm going to talk about two substantive successes, and uh, one which is a com was a complete success, one was a partial success, and uh, the idea is to try and give a human dimension to the statistics, which is what I was challenging this gentleman about. Now, if I start with a failure, I hope the Norwegians among you will forgive me because I'm going to use the case of the Lake Turkana project in the arid north. There's a very large lake there, Lake Turkana, one of the largest lakes in Africa, but it's in a very arid area. It's been in the news recently because there's a dam being built in Ethiopia. The water which feeds that lake is actually in Ethiopia, not Kenya. And Ethiopia is building a very large dam uh, for hydroelectric power and it's estimated that it's going to cause the levels of Lake Turkana to drop to a point where, given the levels of evaporation in that area, it, there may not be a lake there very much longer. Strange thing is, that dam, the dam of the river Omo, is actually supposed to sell most of electricity to Kenya. So it's a big environmental issue. Do we need the electricity more or do we need uh, to keep the lake there? So, Sometime, I think in the 1970s, uh, the Norwegian aid organization decided that the people who live around that lake, who are mostly herders, they move around. It's a very large open area, plains, endless plains, but very little grass. And yet, culturally, those communities consider cattle to be the only wealth. When people discuss their property, they don't say, how much money do you have in the bank? They say, that's a really rich person. Uh, he has, and unfortunately in those communities, it's the men who own the property. He has 300 cattle. Oh, that's nothing. This other guy has 500 cattle. They don't care about money. They don't care about land. In fact, land is communally owned. They don't have separate individual titles. So a clever idea was uh, conceived. Why don't we teach them to fish? They are still up here in Lake Victoria. If we could form them into a fisherman's cooperative, and there are such fishermen cooperatives, say in Lake Victoria and a few other places, they'd make a living that way. And dozens of Norwegian specialists actually went and based themselves in that very, very dry and, and very inhospitable area, and they worked for years, and they set up a fish processing plant. One of the delicacies in Africa which people really like is smoked fish. And the good thing with smoked fish is you don't have to refrigerate it. You catch the fish, you smoke it, you just transport it in a lorry like anything else. So it got going in the end until the cooperative society, which had been formed, the cooperative which had all these people as members, former herdsmen, now fishermen, it paid them their first dividend. And each of them had money in the bank. So the question, which I'm sure you can all guess the answer, what do you think they did with this money when they got this money? They went out and bought cattle, yes. The, the number of cattle actually increased as a result of putting money in these people's pockets. So it didn't matter how hard you worked to show them that the carrying capacity of this place cannot support so many cattle. Some of you have to give up cattle herding, come and be fishermen. They'll actually learn to be fishermen, they'll receive the money, but at the back of their minds, the only thing which really matters is how many cattle do you own? And they went back and bought cattle. And, and the place is now deserted. There's a big, where they used to smoke the fish, I once traveled that area, a big empty building, and, and there's barely any more fishing being done there. So that's something which I well remember when I was fairly young in the 70s, uh, seeing all those big white SUVs moving up and down the road to Lodwa and Lokichang and beyond on this big Norwegian-funded project. And it was a well-intentioned project, well-conceived, 
totally frustrated by one cultural aspect, the definition of true wealth within that community, which somehow had been completely overlooked. So that's, that's my spectacular failure, because millions and millions of dollars went into it. So why don't I talk about the successes next? One of them is actually very famous, though you may not realize this. Uh, at independence in Kenya, uh, if you know anything about African history, you'll know whether it was Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Tanzania. When a black leadership takes over in a country which previously had a white colonial administration, many of the colonial civil servants leave. They feel that they're not sure what the future holds, or they're not that keen to be dictated to by the locals, who the other day were just their garden boys and, 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 and their cleaners. So as a result of this, there's always a skills gap within our first few years. Now, Kenya faced the same situation in the early 1960s, and it was foreseen even before independent. Where will we get doctors from? Where will we get surveyors from? Where will we get accountants from? Where will we get administrators from, economists from, etc.? We had one university then, the University of East Africa, uh, which covered Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya, and different campuses in all the major capitals. It was not producing them fast enough. So the famous president, Kennedy, JFK, is the one who, in attempting to appeal to the black voters who he needed if he was to win against Nixon, I believe in 1960, came up with the idea that they'd have an airlift. Anyone who had done well in high school could register, and you'd be flown to the US, direct charter flight, and various colleges were giving up scholarships, and generous-hearted Americans were funding the airlift, Others were receiving these young Kenyans into their homes where they could stay for a while before they went to college. Because many of them, if I say so myself, it's politically incorrect now, but they had been living in the villages a few days year, years ago. They had been in high school. They didn't know how to use a fork and knife. They didn't know how to cross a road when there might be traffic. They needed someone to break them in. So many generous Americans received them into their homes, lived with them, and then sent them off to college. And the colleges, of course, gave them full scholarships. Uh, no prizes for guessing. Who do you think is the most famous of the group which went to America in this group? Barack Obama. Barack Obama's father, exactly. He, he didn't pay a shilling when he went to study in the US. He was part of that airlift. And there are many, many others. I personally know many elderly Kenyans who went on that same scheme. So this was a case where a newly independent country abruptly having a huge skills gap because all the uh, technocrats were white civil servants who had been brought in to work by the colonial government. Then independence comes. They want to go back to their countries. A good number immigrated to Australia, New Zealand, and places like those. And this airlift project actually helped fill that gap and gave us a smooth transition. Otherwise, the country where this did not happen, most famously, is DRC Congo. The Belgian civil service, which had been running the country, pulled out overnight. The country collapsed and has never recovered since. In fact, it's a strange thing about Belgium. I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but DRC Congo, Rwanda, where there was a Belgian colony, something about uh, Belgium, Belgium is a very peaceful country. I've got nothing against it. But wherever Belgium colonized an African country when they left, it set them on a path to some sort of genocide. As you know, so many millions have died in DRC Congo in recent years. And of course, the uh, genocide in Rwanda is too well known for me to go into there. But I'm just trying to point out, when you've moved in and colonized a country where the borders were arbitrarily drawn by the colonizing force, and which consists essentially of various tribes who historically were enemies and fought each other, raided each other for cattle and so on, when you have brought in a measure of modern uh, technocratic governance, if you pull out that elite which is running that country overnight, it's a recipe for chaos. And anything which will help bridge that gap plays a truly crucial role. And that's what the Airlift Project did. Yes? Yeah, maybe I missed you saying it, but these people who are, who are trained in America, did they also go back afterwards? Or they remain okay, the, the, there are a few who have never come back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's impossible to tell because even the numbers who went, the, the, the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi insists they were about 10,000, they, they, they recorded, other people say five, but the way, and if any of you have had African immigrants in your country, you'll know this, when one person goes, he arranges for his friends, the village to also come, 
okay? So if you had one African in a certain uh, community college or university, and he finds out this is how you apply, of course he'll send a letter and, or send application documents and say, you also apply, they'll give you a scholarship as well. So some may have gone on their own initiative. On the lower figure, it was 5,000. On the upper figure, it was 10,000. And the proof that this worked, 50 years, excuse me, 50 years later, we now have, and any Kenyan will tell this, a huge problem of unemployed graduates. People leave university and can't get jobs. So we are now facing the sort of problem which is in some ways a better problem. We have too many educated people. All over Uganda, Tanzania, we have Kenyans working. I have left out the third example. I was just sticking to, is there any last question before I? Thank you, thank you very much.